irreverent, entertaining, cool. You're listening to LA Talk Radio. You're listening to The Inner Voice with Dr. Fujan Zane, only on LA Talk Radio. Hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Fujan Zane, and welcome to The Inner Voice Show. This show is about making a difference in your life so that you can create a free mind and a heart filled with love toward a fulfilled life. And yes, we can all create a fulfilled life. I'll bring you the latest research in the realm of human sciences, and we'll talk to experts in their fields to bring you the jewel of their knowledge and wisdom. Let me tell you a little bit about my latest book, um, Life Reset, The Awareness Integration Path to Creating a Life You Want. The latest um, psychological model has been presented to you in a series of exercises which can complete um, in your own time, in um, the comfort of your home, um, or go to a therapist for it. But it really allows you to to really reevaluate your life. The awareness integration model has been researched and published with many groups. And latest research was with California um, State Long Beach students, which result, as a result of 68% decrease in depression and 27% reduction in anxiety. We actually um, presented this in the Harvard um, University in one of the conferences. And um, uh, we were doing multiple research on that. You can get the Life Reset book from my website, fujan.com, F-O-O-J-A-N.com. Um, I'm also a therapist. I've been a psychotherapist for about um, 26 years and a coach, life coach. And I have my offices in Irvine, Woodland Hills, Brentwood, um, in California. Or I do a lot of online coaching. And for all those information, um, you can also go to fujan.com. I'd love to hear from you. Um, if you are um, looking at our podcast, um, you ha- you can definitely, uh, you're more than welcome to become a member of the podcast. The podcast is uh, the shows from here, um, LA Talk Radio, and other conversations that I have with people. And i uh, love to have you on there and love to hear from you, um, email me at um, a fujanzane at gmail.com. Call me at 818-648-2140. Let me know the topics you want me to talk about. As I said, this show is about you. So um, I talk to the experts who can bring you what is interesting to you and in your life and um, how you can create a better life. So um, email me, call me, tell me what your needs are, uh, what topics you would like to hear, what conversations you would like to have, so I can support you with all of that. As I want you to um, hear a little bit of this beautiful bowl interlude that Geraldine Glass has created in her CD, Forever Love. just puts you in a very calming state. What about I am about to talk about is not calming. And um, Sunday morning, October 15, 2017, the actress Alyssa Milano used her Twitter account to encourage women who had been sexually harassed or assaulted to tweet the word hashtag me too. In 24 hours, half a million um, people hashtagged me too and tweeted tweeted me too. So did I. I was actually also molested from the age three to eight. So I could um, definitely feel and experience what many of the women have gone through. The statistics about the sexual violence in the U.S. states that one in five women will be raped some point in their life and one in 71 women. Wow, what a difference. 
One in 10 women have been raped by an intimate partner. 91% of the victim of rape and sexual assault are female. 9% are male. One in four girls and one in six boys are sexually abused before the age of 18. United Nations created a research and published it in September 2013, a sweeping study on the roots of sexual violence. The UN surveyed 10,000 men from Bangladesh, China, Cambodia, Indonesia, New Guinea, and uh, Sri Lanka. They asked, they didn't say, have you ever raped a woman? They said, have you um, ever forced a woman to have sex? And the results were that most rapists became serial uh, rapists. Um, 50% they said they started raping as teenager before the age of 15 to 19. One of the fundamental concepts at the heart of the rape culture they found out is the idea that the rape is inevitable. Men can't help themselves, and women just must, therefore, work to protect themselves against it, that it isn't the men's responsibility. The idea that the men are entitled to sexual experience is deeply entrenched. In the research, they found that 70% had sexual entitlement, 40% were angry and wanted to punish, and 50% did not feel guilty or remorse. And part of it, they saw, is because rape goes unpunished in many of the countries. And um, they also did a, a research in Harvard where um, the students were getting raped. And they also um, found out that the men were going unpunished. And you know, basically what they got is they got suspended from school for about two months, and then they came back. And only 3% of the U.S. rapists um, have uh, some jail time. However, the victims are traumatized, and um, they suffer from low self-esteem, depression, anxiety, eating disorders, addictions, um, alcoholism, addiction to drugs, and unhealthy and often um, not successful intimate relationships in their life. So from that perspective, um, it seems like uh, finally there's a conversation that we're having open um, in the United States regarding this. I'm so glad to have um, Hossein Martin Fazili uh, with me. He's an Iranian film director and a poet. His films have won 39 international awards and have broadcast on networks such as CNN, SBS, RT, and Canal. He was shortlisted by the prestigious Sundance Institute to take part in 2008 Sundance International Filmmakers Award. He has won um, 39 awards, and some of them, I'll just tell you, Special Award for Promoting Human Rights in Melbourne International Film Festival in Australia, Best International Film Award, Cape Town World Cinema Festival, South Africa, and Best Film Award, Film Platform in Denmark. Mr. Fazili is now working on a documentary film about Pulan Devi, the bandit queen and later a member of the parliament. Hello, Mr. Hossein Martin. How are you? Hello. Can you hear me? For some reason, I don't have him. Let me put a little bit of a music for all of you, and then I'll go find him. Hello. Did I lose you? Hi. Hi. Yes. Did I lose you? Okay, hold on. No, 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 I'm here. All right, did you hear me at all? Because I was listening. Yes, I can hear you now. Okay, okay, hold on. Yeah. Hello, everyone. We're back to the Inner Voice Show. I'm Dr. Fujian Zain, and I have Mr. Hussein Martin Fazili, the film director who, at this time, working on the documentary film Pulan Devi. Hello, Mr. Fazeli. How are you? 
Hi, good. How are you doing? I'm doing great. It is such a great honor to have you with us on the show, and especially talking about this wonderful, wonderful movie that you're creating. Thank you very much. I'm happy to be here. So let's talk about um, what got you to be interested in Poulan. Mm. And right. for, for our well, audience who doesn't really know Poulan, if you want to let us know a little bit about her. Sure. Um, you know, Poulan was uh, Poulan Devi, her full name. Uh, Poulan is P H um, um, O O L A N, Devi, D E V I. Uh, she was a uh, low caste girl, extremely, extremely poor Indian girl, uh, living in a village uh, in India that doesn't even appear on any map. Even today, mm-hmm. if you Google map that village, it doesn't appear on the Google map. So uh, it's very small, a village of something like 100, 200 people. And um, the story takes place in the 60s and 70s. So she was a low caste person. She was very poor. You know, in India, we have the caste system, yes. uh, higher caste, lower caste. She belonged to the lower caste, the lowest of the low, the poorest of the poor. Uh, without any uh, system of support, um, if I want to really summarize the story, at the age of 17, she's kidnapped by a gang of high caste, um, high caste um, bandits, mm-hmm. and uh, she's um, dumped in a village, a high caste village, and she's gang raped for 10 days. Mm. Now, um, I, you, you, perhaps a lot of uh, your listeners, you know, they may not know India. In India, in rural India. When a girl is raped, usually what happens is that she throws herself into a well. Or, you know, she lives a life of um, desperation, quiet desperation. Uh, not Pulan. Pulan runs away from these, you know, um, rapists. Okay. She goes and uh, forms her own gang and then she hunts down these attackers. She hunts mm. down these rapists. She goes and kills them. Mm. Okay. Now, uh, two things. One is that she's low caste. Those guys are high caste. This was unheard of at the time, right? When a low caste person saw a high caste person, okay, she just bowed down, <clears throat> all right? Uh, but she, did, she does not, not only she runs away, but she goes and hunts them down. And, um, and so she becomes a bandit herself. <clears throat> Excuse me, but a different type of bandit because she was, um, you know, she had felt poverty and social injustice firsthand. She had a great sense of justice. Um, she becomes some form of a Robin Hood in the area, stealing from the rich, giving to the poor. You know, when she hears that um, a, a girl or a woman is raped, uh, she goes and, you know, takes revenge on her behalf. You know, she uh, um, dispenses rough justice on people who, um, who have committed those, uh, those atrocities. And so she becomes the subject of the largest manhunt in Indian history. Wow. Battalions of, you know, Indian army and police are after her, they want her captured, they want her killed, and they cannot do that. For eight years, she escapes, uh, you know, uh, captured. Mm-hmm. At the end, uh, you know, um, the government, the Indian government, puts uh, some conditions forward. Um, she accepts those conditions, you know, she wouldn't be executed. Um, her family would get land, blah, 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 a lot of different conditions. She goes to jail. She serves, uh, she stays in jail for 11 years. In jail, she transforms. She becomes a Buddhist. Mm-hmm. She starts to do yoga and meditation. She renounces violence. She comes out of jail. She enters politics. She runs for parliament. She gets elected. Mm-hmm. This is a, you know, this is almost a kind of a, it's a, it's a, it's a story with, with biblical proportions. I mean, I'm not religi- religious, but, you know, it's really, it has the biblical proportions, some, some you know, biblical proportions to it. Huge transformations. You know, from from being a nobody, you know, to becoming a bandit leader, to become a parliamentarian, mm-hmm. unheard of, yeah. And so she serves, you know, women uh, in parliament, and um, and that's basically her story, yeah. Something about her story got you in your heart. Um, I can sense what, as I was watching the trailer, because I know you're making the movie and you also have it at Kickstarter and. Uh, wanting right. everyone to support the story and the creation of the story. Um, so for right. everyone who's <clears throat> listening, please go to the st- uh, Kickstarter. And uh, do you have the link? Hussein, do you yes, have the link? Yes, <laughs> yeah. C- can you tell us about the link? Oh, yes, uh, sure, sure. 
so you know, uh, you know, this has been um, a, a journey of love. I mean, a friend of mine said it has not been a journey; it has been an odyssey uh, of love. Uh, we have been working on this one for the past four years. Uh, we're near the finish line. We're seventy mm-hmm. percent complete. Uh, but in order to uh, get to the finish line, we still need some money. Uh, that's why, you know, we have started uh, this, uh, we we'll launch, just launched this uh, Kickstarter campaign. Mm-hmm. So if you go to Kickstarter, um, K-I-C-K-S-T-A-R-T-E-R, Kickstarter is a platform, crowdfunding platform. If you go on Kickstarter and uh, and type Poulan, P-H-O-O-L-A-N, our project will show up. And then uh, you can go on, uh, you know, our page and then back this project, uh, you know, with however, you know, it doesn't really matter how much, you know, we have different, different perks, you know, you can, you know, you can donate $5, you can donate $10,000, really no amount is too small. And just, you know, be part of the film, you know, help us make this film because, you know, this, this is not only a story, another story to be told. This is really inspirational. This is really empowering for a lot of women. And let's not forget that we put Poulan's story in, in a social context. Uh, you know, uh, with, with this story, we'll be talking about poverty. We'll be talking about sexual abuse. We'll be talking about gender inequality. And this is not an India-specific thing, film. You know, this is not a, an Indian story only. You know, last year in America, um, food and alone, 270,000 women were raped. Yes. And these are the reported cases, right? Um, so this is, a, this is a global issue. This is a huge problem. In the light of everything that is happening with, you know, with Weinstein and all these powerful people, people who, you know, sit in the White House, you know, it's just, you know, it's, it's a really not a third world issue. It's a global universal issue women's rights, which in my opinion are human rights. So uh, that would be great, you know, to make this, you know, help us make this film so we can, um, uh, you know, show it to people, raise awareness, inspire people, empower people, particularly um, the potential victims of abuse and rape. That's very important to me. Um, if I'm, I'm, you know, if I'm talking, you know, too much, you can cut me off, mm-hmm. but um, no, I, think, I just um, wanted to think there's you're yeah. saying a, a lot of great points. Um, to also uh, elaborate more on the conversation uh, that we're having with about to pull on, I think that um, there's also a distinction between rape and um, sexual molestation and harassment, and each one of right. them still holds the concept of control. Maybe one of right. them is done through violence and one other one is done through um, manipulation um, right. or scare tactics or threats. Mm-hmm. Overall, right. there's still the conversation is not about sexuality. It's really about control and the control that mm-hmm. one one group feels about the other. And, um, right. and you know, a lot of uh, the conversation with rape uh, most of the time shows up from men to women. Um, mm. There, There is also a ratio that is there from uh, women to women, from men to men, and um, mm. from, mm. Um, you know, from women to men. And even the sexual right. harassment and even m- sexual um, molestation also is happens both gender. But it appears mm. that mm. With, the, uh, with the combination of men toward women, there is a higher volume and there is a um, there's more that that happens. Now, as you yeah. were looking at uh, your documentary, looking at the um, culture of India, and then obviously you live in the United States and you're Iranian, so you have three sets of um, cultures to kind of uh, mm. look around and, and, and experience with. Um, did you see these cultures looking at the concept of um, sexuality, men and women, uh, similar, or was it something different that you experienced between these cultures? You mean in terms of going to India and experiencing the Indian culture? Experiencing the Indian example. culture, living in the United States for so long, um, right. you know, and, and mm. seeing the culture here. Um, what type of differences in the regards of the concept of uh, rape or sexual abuse or sexual molestation have mm. you come across? Yeah, you know, the interesting thing is that, you know, you you brought up a very important point that in the end, sexual abuse and rape is not about sex, it's about power. It's a power play, it's a power game. 
And uh, that is uh, true in Poland's case as well, because her rapists, people who gang raped her, they wanted to punish her. So rape was a form of punishment because she had a big mouth, okay? They wanted basically, and this is interesting because Poulan wrote their autobiography uh, called I, Poulan Devi, which was a um, you know, New York Times bestseller um, in, the, uh, in, the, uh, in the 90s. And in that book, she um, explains what happened. And actually, our film is based on her book, based on her autobiography. And she says that because they hated me, they hated my sense of just justice. They hated my big mouth. Mm -hmm. They said, okay, we're going to show you who you are. You are nothing. Mm -hmm. And in order to show me that I was nothing, okay, they raped me and they gang raped me. They said, you got nothing. Everything you have belongs to us, even your own body. So that was a power play, you know, even in Pula's case. I think really this is, um, this is a universal phenomenon. Um, I mean, I was reading um, in a report a few years ago that in 80, 90% of cases, rape cases, um, the man, the rapist, doesn't ejaculate, you know, in the course of rape. Uh, so it's not, you know, it's really not about sex. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, you know, there, I, I, I don't really see a, a difference between uh, the culture of abuse in India and the culture of abuse, for example, in the U.S. or in Canada. Now, when you're thinking, are, yeah. when you're thinking about um, uh, India, uh, mm -hmm. what we gain from India many times from their cultural um, aspect is um, the concept of peace, the concept of spirituality, right. the concept of yeah. yoga, the concept of um, you know respecting animals, and um, yeah. you know cows walking around and everybody respects them, or you know many of the mm. Indians are vegetarian and they do to the respect that they have to the animals, and sometimes yeah. the the messages that exist and coexist together are so mm. extreme and mind boggling. And I know mm -hmm. that many times I have asked um, my friends who are from India um, that mm -hmm. what, how come the concept of rape um, in India and gang rape or even just rape, uh, raping women mm -hmm. is so um, high, so how come is so prevalent and the, the, the legal mm -hmm. system does not necessarily go after punishing men. And I haven't really uh, received an answer that could satisfy me, at least. Um, so I was wondering, in your experience um, of going to India and researching, especially about Pulan, what was your experience? Um, yeah, you know, this is quite interesting. Uh, India um, is a country of extremes. Uh, both good and bad. Um, an Indian friend of mine um, tells me he says, uh, if there is a God and if there is a devil, both live in India. So, uh, and that, of course, I mean, you know, that's, that's um, a metaphor, but it's really, it's, uh, um, it's very close to the reality of India. India is a country of gods and demons, you know, living side by side. You have extreme poverty, you have extreme abuse, and at the same time, you have extreme um, tranquility, extreme peace right nirvana um and uh, and that's the wonder of the country i mean even in the case of somebody like pulan devi you see uh you know we have we have um violence and then we have non-violence we have um a caste system we have buddhism because i mean she became a buddhist in jail um so you know these 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 live side side by side not only uh in the psyche of the country but also in the psyche of the person um, you know, there's something interesting I, I saw in India while I was filming there. And uh, that was that there is, um, you know, the concept of redemption is very strong in India. Mm -hmm. So they believe that even demons can be reformed, right? Even demons can be gods or become gods, uh, which was uh, quite interesting. I mean, I find that to be very humane. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, yeah, India is a country of extremes. Uh, and you see that right away when you land right away you see it right in, right in front of your eyes you see all these you know street kids really sick shivering you know um, and, and nobody nobody cares they're just there you know and not only one or two hundreds and hundreds of them and then 
you know, um, a mile away you see, you know, this ashram with all these monks, Buddhist monks, um, you know, um, meditating and chanting and stuff. So it's just, um, they live so, maybe, maybe that's, that's, you know, the reason why it's happening. I mean, the reason why we have that good extreme is because that good extreme is a reaction to that bad extreme. I have no idea, but, um, they live side by side, yeah. Or that it's a sign that it, the same thing lives in us side by side. We can live and we can mm. become right. either one of those extremes at any point, and then, you mm. know, our own um, responsibility to kind of balance those and and come to a place right. of choosing which one do we, which side do we want to live, which in some mm. sense, uh, going back to pull on story, she lived at mm. all. She lived. Right. The, say, the side of being uh, powerless, uh, she became uh, mm-hmm. violent and created power yeah. from a f- source of uh, violence, then went mm-hmm. into her peace and let go of the violence and then came back yeah. and, um, and kind of claimed her power from a peaceful place and uh, mm-hmm. went into parliament and created her service. Uh, from a different place where at one exactly. point the service needed to come through the violence because she needed to prove something um, to, uh, yeah. maybe from her own power and then um, let go of that became powerless again in the jail and then shifted uh, reformed herself and uh, mm-hmm. utilized her power from a different place um, exactly yeah. go, Good. which also brings me to the rest of the world and all that you hear right now about you know what's going on with um, the uh, the entertainment industry in lo- in right. the, you know the U.S. and uh, taking mm-hmm. a stand and uh, the woman taking stand on many layers. The woman taking a stand on sexual harassment, on on uh, you know molestation, on rape. Um, mm-hmm. They're even mm-hmm. taking a stand on uh, you know the men's infidelity. Uh, it just seems right. like there's a stance that now is being taken from a whole different place and not from a victimization. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think I think it's uh, really the right time to talk about these stories um, uh, and, you know, kind of bring them to the open. You know, every every man has a mother, you know, every man, not every man, but most men, you know, they started have from sisters, there. <laughs> you know, yeah, you know, female friends. And to be honest with you, I mean, I go deeper than that. I think there is a there is a. Um, there is a woman in every man and there is a man in every woman. I mean, you know, the female and male size. I mean, that's, that's my experience personally. Uh, they live side by side. And, uh, if one side of you is brutalized, the other side will suffer as well, you know. Um, so, um, in a sense, you know, I'm, I've been, it's funny that, you know, I've been making films in the past four or five years almost exclusively on women's issues and not only documentaries and you know just somebody brought that to my attention the other day that you know the films they've made in the past six years they've all been about women and women on you know on women's issues and subconsciously i've been doing that i guess and because i think um you know gender equality is uh, one of the biggest social issue um you know uh, social justice issues of our time I really see the fate of uh, women and men linked, you know, connected. So, um, in the end, it's very personal. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to make peace with my female side. Um, the female side is, you know, trying to make peace with the male side. And they're supposed to be in peace. That's the funny thing. I mean, it's the, I, mean I don't know how this conflict happens, you know, and it goes to such an extreme length, um, you know, um, becomes so, so bad gets so out of control but uh yeah but you know uh, really um i i hope that um with all these women coming forward talking about um uh, you know abuse talking about the kind of sexual power plays um by big players in hollywood other places the entertainment industry not only there um and by all these men backing them and supporting them and society supporting them um, we get to a better place, you know. Yeah. Um, I remember, you know, to, to Hussein, I remember I was um, um, 18, and I was mm-hmm. in uh, Arizona, 
um, mm -hmm. in ASU. And I remember I went to this um, school, Barbizon School of Modeling. And um, right. they were like, yeah, we'll, you know, we'll definitely take you. And um, we'll start it with that. And I had a minor in um, uh, acting. So my minor, my right. major was psychology, my minor was acting. And I remember mm -hmm. that in the world of modeling and acting, um, as an 18-year-old, this message was very, very, very prevalent. It was out there as a common knowledge and as something that would people tell you um, as if uh, they wanted to support you to know that if you wanted to get ahead, that uh, right. make sure that you know how to manipulate mm -hmm. and sleep with the right people to get there. And it was mind-boggling to hear that conversation so prevalent. And um, although it might be said in a funny way or with a wink or a twist, and it came from both men and women. It wasn't like it was just coming from men. So it's yeah, interesting. Yeah, yeah. And when, you know, now the news is out there and everybody's like, well, we all knew. We had, yes, everybody kind of knew all this. And some, you know, as they were holding it, you get that something in our era is changing. Where right, yeah. Where yeah. something that used to be a cultural way as a habit. Or when I talk mm -hmm. to my clients who are men, many of them say, like, we go to parties, and then, you know, women go into one location, men go into another room. And many times they talk about freely about their sexual experiences or extramarital um, experiences and sexual experiences mm -hmm. as a conversation to be had, as a conversation that is so common to mm. it's just it's the it's supposed to be there to to state right. that we're we're a man and it's mm. interesting that um that at least in some realm when it comes to work environment um there there appears to be a shift toward that type of a balance toward that type of a respect toward that type of you know if somebody would like to have the sexual experience wonderful they can have it you know they're two consenting right. adults and they can have it Right. And if not, then there's a respect into the, right. you know, whatever that relationship is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, I totally agree with you. I think, I mean, the, the word is consensual. You know, I mean, the, if there is a consent, you know, whatever. I mean, you know, um, nobody has, I don't care what happens in people's bad bedrooms as long as it's consensual and uh, done, you know, uh, within that, that, that um, you know, framework. Um but um, there is a lot of, um, you know, I mean, the, for example, in the case of Howard Weinstein, I understand because I mean, I'm, I've been in this industry for the past 17 years. I mean, I've been fortunate to be dealing with people, good people, people with, people, you know, like really good people, okay? <laughs> people who uh, respect others uh, and treat everyone with, uh, with a great deal of respect. But, uh, in, but uh, you know, I've been to those you know, I've, I've seen that. I've been to those territories, and I know how it is. I think um, it really um, has a lot to do with the structure of the system, because when the system is built on, uh, you know, credit stealing and backstabbing, and uh, you know, um, the question always is, what is it in what what is in it for me? And you know, um, all that you know, extreme me first culture. Uh, that is the it's kind of you get to that situation you get to that place where you know people try to um assert themselves and try to kind of get a sense of um get a sense of power empowerment by abusing others by using others you know uh and that that was i think clearly you know the case with harvey Weinstein. he didn't need that he didn't need to do that but he didn't really need to uh, abuse women like that. He was, he was, you know, he was, he was, he was the most important producer, I guess, in Hollywood. You know, his films have won 81 Oscars, nominated for 200. But right? I mean, you know, but by being nice, he was not particularly nice looking. But by being nice, by being, um, you know, a good person, he could he could have a lot of women if he wanted to, without having to force himself upon them. Why did he do that? I think that comes from. A, a sick type of mentality, you know, it's a mentality that gets nourished, you know, in that structure. 
um, you know, where, where you know where everybody bullies everybody. You know, if, you know, it's about who you are. It's about how much power you have. People, you know, lick your boots if you have power. If you don't have power, they push you around. You know, this backstab you the moment they can. It's just, you know, it's the culture of that thing that uh, kind of creates this um, these these people and these monstrosities. It's not the person only, you know, and that's my that has been my experience. So. I always, you know, when I when I work on a film, I always talk about the karma of the film, the karma of the project. Okay, I really want to associate uh, with people whom I like and I trust. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, I don't really want to work. I mean, sometimes I, I, you know, reject people, uh, refuse to work with people who can get the job done. I know they can get the job done, right? Yes. But I know that that you know I don't really relate to their culture. I don't relate to. Um, their mentality, the way they see the world, and the, the, way, the way they see their place in the world, and I think that's that's important. I mean, that has saved me personally. You know, I don't have terrible stories to tell. Um, at least when it comes to my crew members, when it comes mm -hmm. to you know the you know my my, my cast and crew and you know, uh, films that I've made, the, 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 there are no terrible internal stories right. <laughs> to tell. Uh, you... Everything that bad that has happened has happened, you know, outside of us, to us. Right. We haven't done it, you know, anything, you know, we, we, we don't do these things to ourselves. We haven't. So I think a, a lot has to do with the culture also. Yeah. There's also this uh, appears to be a culture of entitlement where uh, the power and the money and right. the status comes, the entitlement of receiving services rises. And it seems like mm -hmm. one of the biggest entitlement is toward the sexual experience. It's no longer, right, right. Uh, it's, that's where it does not become conceptual because the, the entitlement somehow becomes there. And then since the entitlement mm -hmm. is there, it's like you, uh, the same way you might push um, right. to get a right. better product right. or a better service or any of those, then it just seems like even this aspect of entitlement, it puts you in a position to uh, demand whatever else and, and ex you know, the extreme demand because um, like you get bored with what you have and you want the next level and the right. next level of challenge and it just seems like yeah. the same level of challenge has been going along because when you look at Bill Cosby, you look at Weinstein, you look, you look at many mm -hmm. of these people who were in yeah. politics or entertainment or who were in power, they really right. didn't need to do many of the things that they did. It just seems yeah. like um, they were pushing the envelope and the, the threshold of what can I get away with or how else can I push the right. or push uh, in the sense of right. my entitlement of what I can get. And at right, one point, right. well, you know, the rug was taken out and says, no, you can't do that anymore. And then all of those people who were pushed um, in the mm. middle, suddenly, like, show up and say, "Yes, that happened to us also." Mm -hmm. But it, it mm -hmm. just they mm -hmm. had to go from one ele element to the next before somebody said, "Enough is enough." Right, exactly. And you know, let's not forget that you know, uh, in the case of, for example, Harvey Weinstein. I mean, he's been doing this for four decades right now. Yes. I mean, how many women have you know um, stepped forward and talk about you know talked about this? Fifty, sixty. Um, these women, I mean, the numbers should be hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. Mm -hmm. This hasn't been, you know, one woman a year or two women a year. So imagine how many women are silent even now, you know. So there's more work to be done. Um, I'm just, you know, it's really mind boggling how, uh, how, um, you know, um, Persistent and how, how how regular this thing has been in the case of somebody like Harvey Weinstein, but I totally agree with you. I mean, that's having a sense of entitlement. I mean, there is really no difference between what these people do, what these people feel, and what kings did in you know 12th or 13th century. Yeah. You know, in other countries, because I mean, as a king, when you went to a village or town, you could pick up any girl you wanted. Yeah. And take her to the castle. Right? You, you didn't even have to ask for permission, uh, you know, from parents or even be nice to them. Okay, they gave their girl to you willingly, you know. Uh, that's, that was, of course, an extreme case of entitlement. They really, you know, the guy sees himself as the king, all right? And um, that kind of king, of course, and, you know, um, you know behaves kingsly. 
uh, in brackets. So I think I think that that it has a lot to do with the sense with that sense of entitlement. You know, there's also um, um, another piece, no. Hussein, which is um, when you said, "How come there isn't a hundred people who are yeah. there but not talking?" And mm. I realize that with my own experience and many of my mm. clients who come to my you know psychology um, office, I when I do psychotherapy with people who have been abused as a child, who have been molested, right. raped, or just abused right. as a child, I think that they also buy into this concept of um, learned helplessness, where you see right. the world as. Um, a place of an intrusion and that you are surviving that intrusion but then the other piece is if you've learned the game and many mm. women and men have had to learn the game the same thing right. I said like I chose not to go through that game because I was you know molested before and I didn't want to go through that game but there are many mm. people who actually have experienced where if this is the way that I know uh, the world is so I'm going to participate in that game Although yeah, right. the game is it, an entitlement game, but I will participate in it in order to get where I want to get. So although those that, that group who mm-hmm. have participated in the same game um, have also been, in a sense... Um, uh, you know, c- kind of abused just by the by right. the context of the game, but they don't see yeah. themselves as the victim uh, because they mm. par- they participated in it in a, in a way, and they might feel guilt right. or shame or uh, disgusted with themselves or upset or sad and traumatized mm-hmm. by it. The same way that you know, I work with so many people who have been raped or molested, and in the therapy session, they said. Well, in the midst of it, I also enjoyed it. Or in the midst of it, I think that because I wore such and such a dress, maybe I instigated it. Or it was my fault Mm -hmm. because I went to his room anyway. So when you see that that type of uh, uh, shame and blame given to themselves, it would stop them from coming. Plus Mm -hmm. that dealing with um, the the legal system and the public shame that comes where um, they they have to be re-traumatized by being right, questioned right. constantly. And I remember mm-hmm. I worked with rape cases where I was to support to them, taking them to attorneys and the uh, court system. And they truly got re-traumatized because the attorneys from the other side were making sure right. that, you know, they wanted to let them know that they this didn't happen and it's their figment of imagination and they were participating willingly. And these people mm-hmm. kept getting traumatized by that whole system. So I right, could right. see where many people um, would not put themselves out there to get re-traumatized or re-shamed by uh, the system or the public or even their own family system. Right, right, right. I totally, uh, totally agree. I think it's a, I mean, in a sense, it's like, you know, you experience rape a second time. Yes. Uh, when you're going through this legal system, you know, and you have to explain things and you have to describe details and stuff. It's just, uh, I, I, I totally agree with you. I don't think we have the right system, um, uh, you know, to deal with um, the victims and to deal with, you know, rape cases. Um, there, there is not enough sensitivity, you know. It's, it's not a delicate system. Yeah. It's very male-based, if you want to really think about it. Yeah, it's um, and it's right, right, you know, it's like, you know, um, 70% of anti-abortion leaders in America are men. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They never get pregnant. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and I, you know, I'm, I'm not saying, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying abortion is good. I'm just saying, okay, if y- you need women to talk about abortion, yeah, yeah, you do know, you ex- they are the it? ones who get pregnant. So do the you, same, you know, with the legal system. Yeah. Do you experience it differently in Canada? I know you live in Canada now. Mm. Do you experience yeah. the the system different? It's not as patriarchal as uh, maybe the U.S. or or India or Iran. Yeah, that's true. I mean, you know, Canadians tend to be uh, tend to be nice, okay, and that goes a long way. Uh, of course, I mean they have they have uh, huge problems here in Canada as well. But there are a couple of different you know a couple of different factors in, in regard to you know Canada. Um, yeah, you know they don't apply to India or America. First of all, <clears throat> the concept of open space, in my opinion, Canada is the second largest country in the world, all right, with a population of thirty five million. Yeah, people. Mm-hmm. You really ha- see a lot of space in this country. Uh, you know, you travel through, um, at least, you know, uh, when I traveled through America, I mean, I didn't really go to middle America that much. 
but uh, you know, and you know, of course in India, you see a lot of people. You see, pop- there was the, you know the, the kind of demography, the, the, the population, the sheer number of people is overwhelming. You know how many. Um, but in Canada, you know, you have all these barren lands, untouched territories. Okay, you can walk for miles in the woods without sending, seeing any other human being. I think that you know that that vital space that kind of relaxes you more. This is my experience, right? When people, you become nicer being in this environment. Mm. Uh, but also, I think it's the culture of the country. Um, I think uh, um, they they put a lot of emphasis on on tolerance. Mm-hmm. And on respect for the other, okay. And and the legal system is actually quite. Um, it has zero tolerance towards things like, uh, you know, um, violence against women or you know uh, sexual abuse and stuff. Mm-hmm. And uh, and um, you know you don't have, you know, the culture of. I mean, you know, that kind of, I call this, I mean, a lot of, you, you have a lot of lawyers in the U.S., and I understand that it's, you know, it's necessary, but it's really a country of laws, um, the United States. Um, and so, um, you know, and sometimes, you know, those laws are badly written, and sometimes they're randomly enforced, you know, and you have problems with that. Yeah. Canada is not a country of laws. It's more like a country of uh, kind of unwritten principles, you know. That's my experience, at least. Mm-hmm. Um, you just you just know that there are there is a pattern of behavior. There is a certain code of conduct which is acceptable and honorable, and you should do that. And you should follow that. Yes. But of course, I mean, this is this is you know this is on the surface. Right. If you really go deep down, you know, you go to poor areas and go to, for example, uh, you know, native communities. Uh, Inuit communities, you see a lot of abuse and you see a lot of social ills as well. So it's just the surface. You know. Yeah, we're looking at a lot of um, human dynamic where how a, a person uses their power where they can or if they yeah. have the opportunity to utilize their power, what type of, um, from what principles do they choose to live that? And I see it that um, something in the uh, story of Pulan brought you into really uh, bringing her onto the screen, onto the mm-hmm. heart of people, to really talk about um, what uh, the um, violent power and uh, disrespect that comes with power can mm-hmm. uh, can create, and what you know what the results are, and then when it shifts, where the power right. joins principle and then joins love and giving and service, what can right. happen and how can one person go from one extreme to the other to uh, yeah. receive that so um that's beautiful and i know that this the you know we really want uh, everyone who's listening to support for this film to uh complete to be out so everyone who's listening please go uh, to kickstarter.com and then put in pulan p h o o l a n P H O O L A N and uh, support as much as you love to, or you can, you choose um, in order for this um, for this wonderful uh, documentary about uh, Pulan Devi to uh, shed a light to what is possible for um, anyone who can go from one end to the other extreme and uh, create such a courage and their essence of who they are to flourish and then to be able to flourish um, and support others. So you got, we have two minutes. So tell me all that you want the listeners to know about you, Pulan, and how to get uh, this wonderful documentary out in the world. Sure. Uh, thanks, Vijay. You know, basic the film is, of course, a feature-length documentary. It's ninety minutes with dramatic recreations. So it's going to be, um, um, you know, an exciting film. Um, I've come back from India with fifty-six hours of great material. Um, you know, we have been. We have. I've talked to a, a lot of everybody in India. You know, her Pulan's parents, her sisters, her brother. You know, her ex-gang members, people that 
you know, uh, she shot at, you know, um, her, you know, parliament secretary, her colleagues in parliament, you know, women's rights activists, everybody. Uh, and so uh, we've been to India actually four times so far. Um, it's been a long journey, and I think, uh, you know, we have exciting material to work with. Our edit process has started. As I said, this is, um, you know, the last mile. And if we walk this mile, then, uh, you know, the film is going to be in the can. We're thinking of April 2018. Um, you know, if the campaign is successful, then the film will be uh, will be out. And I'll be very happy to travel to L.A. Uh, for the premiere of the film and actually meet with people mm-hmm. who would love to see the story and to get inspired by it. Let's That's not fantastic. forget that Pulan is not only the story of a girl who fought back. Uh, you know, it's a story about, you know... Um, poverty it's a story about abuse it's a story about the resilience of human spirit yes it's a story about rising above your circumstances yeah it's a story that and it's any a story part of, of us, love yeah we yeah. can connect each one of us who's watching we can connect to a part of Pulan and looking at how we can also exactly. access that part of us it's been such a pleasure to meet you on the phone to meet you in the radio and hopefully I get to meet you in person very soon Absolutely. I'm looking forward to that as well, Fujian. Thanks so much for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you for being with us. Hossein Martin Fazeli, um, documentary uh, that is coming out by the name of Poulan. Please go to kickstarter.com, Poulan, P-H-O-O-L-A-N. For all of you who are listening with your heart with us, thank you for being with us. Thank you for listening and create a wonderful, wonderful day and a week and a life for yourself and everyone around you. Until next week, bye-bye. You're listening to The Inner Voice with Dr. Fujan Zain, only on LA Talk Radio, 